In the small town of Chatterley, Mississippi, the Great Flood of 1927 was more than just the most catastrophic river flood in the history of the United States. It was a herald of change. While the rising river and broken levees ravaged the former plantation town from the outside, racial and social tensions tore it apart from within. But when an otherworldly being fell from the sky and challenged everything these divided people knew, it changed things forever. If only the book Strange Fruit lived up to that summary. It doesn't even come close to that. Mark Wade and J.G. Jones decided, because reasons and racism, to make this book. Now, I'd love to say the book is horrible, but it's not. J.G. Jones brings it with this book. I got it out of the library, so I'm using pics I found online. But I flipped through the physical book about seven or eight times. I can't find a bad page. Every page, every panel, masterpiece of art. What I really love is Jones' use of color. I'm not sure what media he used, watercolor or acrylic or oil, but he gave it a washed out tone and that really places a story. You take one look at a page and you instantly know it's in the early 20th century. It's just got that look. His use of color, character placement, panel layout, all of it is so good you never get bored. There's always something to discover in a panel and you never get lost on the page even though there's this kind of washed out tone to all the coloring. I can't give Jones enough credit. This book is so well done, you can just pick a page, frame it, put it on a wall. That good. I wish I could say the same about the story. Mark Wade. Oh boy. Where to begin, where to begin. Wade is like an angry black man trapped in a trollish, privileged white man's body. It's like, imagine if Kwanzaa Asaja Yefo had talent and was white, but was still really racist. That's pretty much Wade's approach here. Go find yourself a Black Lives Matter activist, one who's screaming racist shit about white people. You think they hate white people? <sighs> they ain't got nothing on Mark Wade. Check out this panel. Can you spot the racist? Here, let me help you. Every white person you see in the book is racist. Every one of them. Even the little boy? Yes, the little boy. What about his dog? And the little dog too. And of course, all the black people are faultless victims of racism. You've got Mike Epps playing the shifty nigga. You've got Cedric the Entertainer as a sacrificial nigga. I mean, the smart engineer sent from Washington to deal with the flood damage. Something that would never happen. Who in Washington, D.C. would be stupid enough to send an educated black man down to Mississippi in 1927, let alone to explain to these likely racist white people how to save their town? The whole time I'm reading this, I'm like, Cedric, you better start cracking some jokes because they about to lynch your black ass. And oh, they're itching for a lynching. All these white men dressed in their grandmammy sheets can't wait to catch a nigga by the toe, beat him, and hang him on a tree. And that's actually where the title comes from. It's based on the song Strange Fruit, made famous by Billie Holiday. It's a song about the reality that in the 1920s and the 30s, it was pretty common for black men to be lynched. The song is a protest against that culturally accepted form of murder. Even recording the song put Holiday at risk of violence and even death. That's a pretty daring move on her part, and if Wade and Jones wanted to use the title of the song, they should have tried to live up to it. Instead, we get Black Superman. He falls from the sky, jacks up some white people, and wraps a confederate flag around his waist. Because Mark Wade is anything if not clever. Want to know what Black Superman's name is? Guess. Come on, guess. I'll give you a hint. His name is fucking Johnson. As in Johnson. As in because he's a big black dude, he's got a big black dick, Johnson. Which Mike Epps couldn't help but point out, so he named Black Superman Johnson. Oh, it doesn't end there. Mm -mm. See, Captain Mandingo never says a fucking word in the whole story. He's a super smart alien who knows advanced physics, was tortured by the Empire, can pull a church off his foundations in one piece with just a rope and swim with the motherfucker. Seriously, when I saw this panel, the first thing that popped into my head was Cinema Sins. This works. He can heal people with his Jigaboo technology, but he never says a word. He just saves the town and then drowns because Captain Mandingo apparently can't swim. You didn't cross all the stars, came from another planet, and yet your black ass still can't swim? Apparently he can't fly either. It's like, mommy, how come that black Superman can't fly? He's with those white people. Here's the thing though. Mark Wade fancies himself this uber progressive. He's so woke he invented being woke. 
He doesn't have a racist bone in his body, and if he did, he'd rip it out through his pee hole. But what he wrote was a black man who doesn't talk and doesn't do anything on his own. He doesn't show the tiniest bit of agency. At that point, he's just a tool, both in the story and to serve Wade. There's a word to describe exploiting people with certain skin tones for your own benefit. Say it with me. Racist. I give Wade the total benefit of doubt. He's not trying to come off as racist, but he's totally being racist by having Captain Mandingo have no personality. He's just King Dingaling slanging dick to fix the levees. Now here's the damnedest thing. I don't hate the book. It's actually well written. It's just that, like Kwanzaa's Black, there's no story. There's plenty of plot. Clearly stuff happens. There's the flood that keeps getting worse, a missing white child, racist cops beating up Mike Epps. But nothing of any consequence happens. The summary said that Black Superman changes everything. That nigga didn't change a thing. Every white person was still racist even after he saved them. The black people were still getting ready to move up north for the black migration. The only thing that changed was Scarlett O'Hara realized she was being used by Skinny JR for his political gains. Otherwise, it ends exactly where it begins. None of the characters have any development. They're complete caricatures, or if you want to be generous, archetypes. But they never move past that. The only reason it comes off as okay is because Wade is a good writer. In the hands of a less talented, more egotistical, holiday-named man, you'd get chitlins wrapped in garbage. The weird thing is, I don't know the point of this book. I get that it's Jones and Wade apologizing for being white men, but that's not really a point. That's just what happens after you jerk off watching that Black China sex tape. I'm sure that there's some obscure meaning that I'm missing, so if any white listeners want to white explain it to me, I'd be grateful. I mean, this shit is so dark, it's like someone threw Wesley Snipes' naked ass in front of my face. Could you turn it down a notch? I'm not saying get Michael Jackson up in here, but could you at least make it precious purple so I can see what the fuck you're doing? So, final thoughts. Oh no, there's no going to be no segue. We're just going to keep going. So, final thoughts. Check the book out. The art is well worth it if you want to buy it. You could pass on reading it. You don't really need to. If you really want to read it, then at least it'll be better than that shit that was written by Mfufu. Thanks for listening. Please hit that subscribe button and notification bell so you can catch me throwing all sorts of shade at different people. Later.